as um, has kind of been said, it might seem maybe a more abstract question, a less pressing question, a less vital question um, to discuss, but actually it's a really important question to discuss and answer, and at the end of the day to be prepared for, because you know when revolutionary movements start to happen, questions like, is it okay to kill people? Should we arm the workers? Um, these can become of the utmost importance, and if we have an incorrect understanding of these, or if we're um, kind of can be stifled by different pressures or different attacks on the basis of morality, um, this could completely derail a revolutionary movement. And time and time again, you've seen kind of pre-revolutionary movements or kind of movements of the workers that have been um, that have been kind of betrayed by the leaders who have pacifist illusions and kind of call for workers um, not to take up arms in the moment when they should take up arms. Um, an example of that kind of would be the the movements in Sudan in 2018, where you had a huge um, movement of the workers um, and the kind of press layers all in struggle. And you had the ruling class use these reactionary armed bands of people going around terrorizing the workers. And in that movement and in that moment the leadership of that movement did succumb to kind of accusations of amoralism and did kind of succumb to pressures from pacifism and these ideas violence is wrong we must turn the other cheek we need to show the better way and that led to that movement facing a huge setback um, obviously things have moved on and today there is still mo big movements in Sudan but that that whole episode kind of shows the importance of the question of morality. And if we don't have a very clear question and a clear and developed understanding of morality, um, it can really put the class struggle back and can really, um, really cause us problems. But, um, and quite often I think in society, Marxists are kind of painted, especially by maybe liberal kind of figures or right wing figures as kind of amoral creatures, obsessed, um, and who would do anything, who would lie, who would cheat, who would murder to achieve the aims of, of you know, the revolution, would achieve their aims. And they think that we have no understanding of morality and we'll just basically do whatever to get what we want, um, which is obviously not the case. And actually I would say morality is a really important question for us and we have actually a deeper more scientific understanding of what morality is um, than liberals do or than right-wingers do or than kind of the average person might have and as Marxists we don't just say oh some things are good because they are or this idea is wrong or you should never do this just because that's the way things are in fact we should be able to justify and explain why our actions are good and bad why our actions are justified or unjustified um, and, and because of that, we have a more, much more deeper and much more scientific understanding of morality, I would argue, than kind of other layers. Um, a kind of key text when you're looking at, at kind of Marxism and ethics, Marxism and morality, is Their Morals and Ours by Trotsky. And that's something I would really recommend if you've not had a chance to read it. Um, it's a kind of pamphlet. Um, I would really recommend, I'm sure the bookstall will have copies downstairs. Um, and it was written by Trotsky in 1938, where he was facing quite a, gl a bleak global situation. You know, the Stalinists had kind of taken hold in Russia. Um, a lot of the old Bolsheviks had been killed or had been imprisoned after the Moscow Trials. There was a lot of demoralization um, globally, I guess, from kind of communists and, and other people. Um, and outside of Russia in particular, a lot of kind of liberals and a lot of people who had maybe been Stalinist or had supported the USSR but kind of changed their mind started to use the question of morality to really attack. Russia to attack the USSR and even more seriously to attack the October Revolution and at that time there was this accusation and I think it's something probably we've all still heard today that you know Stalinism and the kind of terrible things that happened because of the Stalinist degeneration were the inevitable result of the violence of the lack of morals of Bolshevism the lack of the morals of the of the Russian Revolution and um, so basically blaming Stalinist reaction on the amorality of, of of the Russian Revolution. Um, and it's obviously you know, quite ludicrous to say that the degeneration of the USSR and obviously all the crimes that came with that, you know, the corruption, the secret police, tortures, murder, then those were, that those were inevitable because the revolution was somehow bad or amoral or violent. Um, and obviously apart from being very basic and very crude, it looks at things as 
a very static, isolated abstractions, you know, just taking a list of features and saying, oh, if you have this, 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 and this, then you're a dictatorship and that's bad. Um, but instead, you know, we look at events in relation to one another. We look at things as part of um, a historical process of change. Stalinism is not just a static dictatorship, but was a bureaucratic reaction against a revolution in an underdeveloped and isolated country. And, you know, the kind of crimes of Stalinism and the kind of terrible things that happened under Stalinism was a move to re-establish privileges in a case where the material base to abolish them couldn't be sustained. Um, and so I would say, like, we, we don't just believe that Stalinism happened because we don't have enough morals, so that's all bad things will always end up happening. Um, we have a much more deeper um, analysis of it. And on this point, Trotsky um, writes in Their Morals and Ours, Stalinist frame-ups are not a fruit of Bolshevik amoralism. No, like all important events in history, they are a product of the concrete social struggle. Um, and I think that's really kind of important when we face these kind of accusations of amoralism. Um, and to actually explain, no, this is the reason why those things happened under the USSR. It's not just because of violence in the Russian Revolution. Um, and uh, it was kind of in the context of these accusations that, that um, Trotsky wrote this pamphlet to kind of tackle this question that the lack of morals that Marxists have don't just mean the Russian Revolution degenerated, but this idea that it would mean revolutions would always degenerate. That basically attacking the fact you could ever even have communism by saying, oh no, if you have violent means, you're going to end up with a violent society or something like that. Um, but before I even address the kind of question of morals and, and what we kind of think about morals, I would just like to flip the question, you know, on these liberals, on these right wings, on these other strands of political thought, which seek to attack us through accusations of immorality. And, you know, any kind of a moral compass that, that these different layers are seeking to judge us, us by, capitalism obviously comes out eternally worse. Um, you know, the kind of attack that, oh, violence is wrong, killing is wrong, you should never take up arms, you know, these kind of calls. Yet at the same time, these layers are more than happy to support imperialist wars, where the violence is for what? It's for nothing, it's for imperialism or it's for some kind of abstract um, support for the nation compared to us who are actually engaged um, in wars to put an end to the current system um, that we live under and that causes so much violence. Um, and even when you start to look at, you know, kind of accusation that you have no regard for life, life is so precious. Um, and I'm sure you've all heard the kind of figure of um, 100 million dead because of communism, which was kind of popular, has been popular with right-wingers since uh, 1997, when it was released in this book called The Black Book of Communism. So they basically argue 100 million people have died because of communism, or 1.2 million people um, a year. And while there's a lot of um, exaggeration in those figures, and um, a lot of liberty taken with what was included, even if you take that at face value, we can only imagine the capitalism's death toll, the death toll of capitalism. Um, you know, if we look at figures the, in a normal year, the World Health Organization estimates that 3.8 million people die from lack of clean water, 1.5 million people die from preventable disease, and 14 million people die from hunger. And that's just a kind of normal year. So that's already 19 million people, considerably more than ever has been accused of communism killing have, have been killed and that le leaves out you know imperialist wars it leaves out people dying from lack of medical care leaves out unsafe conditions at work poor housing no housing at all and all the kind of ills that are an inevitable product of the capitalist system um, and that's before we even discuss the kind of outbreak of coronavirus and um, something which could have been completely prevented and completely controlled and um, if the system had the interests of the people at its heart, but obviously doesn't. The system is run in the interest of profit, um, it's run in the interest of the ruling class, and um, at least five million people um, have already died um, from coronavirus. Um, the real figure is likely to be far, far higher than that. And that was all completely inevitable. So I think it's just the utter cheek that they, they dare to accuse us of having a disregard for life, or us being um, letting people die and, and being engaged in violence and killing. When you look around at the capitalist system, um, 
and that it's it's full of um, violence, it's full of death and destruction, and we are the people fighting to overthrow that and put an end to that. Um, and so, um, I would actually like to use the words of the famous kind of Scottish Marxist John McLean in his speech from the dock um, in 1918, and he kind of said, "I am not here then as the accused. I am here as the accuser, the accuser of capitalism, which is dripping with blood from head to foot." I think it's really important in any kind of discussion on morals to to lay out the complete hypocrisy of of these kind of liberals and right wingers who dare um, to say that what we believe in or our we're immoral and um, when the system that they defend with every um, inch of their being is so violent and so horrible and so much worse by any kind of moral compass that they're judging people by. For the next part um, of my kind of lead off, um, I want to look a bit deeper at the kind of questions of, well, what, what is mor morality? What are morals? Um, or on what basis do we ascribe something as wrong or as right? And kind of look at the question are, of is there eternal moral truths? You know, are there things which are always wrong or always right? And I think, you know, in society, there is an understanding of certain things being bad or certain things being wrong. Um, I'm sure if you went out and asked someone on the street, you know, what, what is wrong? They would maybe say like, oh, it's, it's wrong to kill people or it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to lie, um, those kind of things. I think there is a general understanding of society of certain things being wrong or certain things being bad or certain things being immoral. But, you know, we're Marxists, we're very scientific and it's important for us not to just take that at face value and go, all right, well, that's what people think is right and wrong. That, that must just be it. You know, we have to actually go in and an analyze these things. And I think a key question is that, are those things static? Do people always think that those things are right and wrong? And I think the clear answer is no. You know, views on different moral questions have changed incredibly over time, quite drastically. Um, and the fact that morality is not um, is not static at all, but it reflects wider society and reflects um, the kind of society that we're living in. Um, so I guess one kind of example um, would be, I'm sure if you ask people, most people out on the street, you know, adultery, is it wrong to cheat on someone? A lot of people go, oh yeah, that's wrong, like that's bad. Um, and that's an idea most people in our society probably hold. Um, but this whole concept would be completely bizarre and probably even difficult to comprehend to someone living in a, a kind of primitive agricultural society where marriage doesn't even exist um, or monogamy doesn't even exist. And because individual marriage isn't a component of their society, of course there wouldn't be moral rules rules or moral understandings around kind of cheating or adultery and things like that. Um, and it would be completely bizarre, the question of, of whether that is right or wrong. Um, another question is, of course, slavery, something which I'm sure the vast, vast majority of people, if you ask them, is slavery right or wrong? They'll say, no, slavery is wrong. It's disgusting. It's terrible. Um, and of course, we would agree. But in ancient Greece, in ancient Rome, um, probably not the slaves themselves, but the citizens, the, the, the other people who lived there, we find it completely ludicrous, the idea that slavery was bad or slavery was wrong. Um, which is completely understandable because their entire society was built upon the basis of slave labor. So of course the morality would reflect that. I think there's so many examples and maybe people would like to come in in the discussion of different questions where we can clearly see that the morality is not at all static and that it changes to reflect the kind of society that we're living under. And um, uh, yeah, and the the kind of um, understandings of the day. I think that's quite clear and it's something that we as Marxists view morality as being a product of an epoch. Um, morality is not natural. Morality is not innate. Um, moral, moral views are part of class society. Um, and they are enacted in, in a given society through maybe religious rules, through laws, through moral norms, and they change and reflect the situation, the position, and the interests of a given ruling class. Um, morality is a key component of ideology. Um, so kind of looking at what ideology kind of is, is, the ways of kind of seeing the world, the explanations, the half truths which the ruling class espouses and kind of puts out into society in order to justify its existence, in order to 
um, justify the existence of the system that we live under and in order to maintain its power. So obviously looking at kind of slave societies, um, of course the, the morality of the day which was pushed forward with, by the ruling class was that slavery is good and fine um, in order to justify that society, to preserve its existence and to maintain the power of the ruling class. And of course, you know, ruling classes can maintain their power in loads of different ways. You know, they have the state, if we look at our, our current um, society, they have like the media, all these kind of things. Um, but this alone is not enough to completely preserve the power of, of the ruling class because ruling classes are a tiny minority who are preserving their power over the vast, vast majority of society. Um, so ideology is like an extra kind of way that the ruling class tries to maintain its power. Um, and morality is a key part of that. Um, and where that leaves us kind of as Marxists, our role is obviously to strip away these illusions and to kind of reveal the false nature of, of bourgeois ideology. Um, so if we look at kind of morality, that's a real key component of ideology, a key way that people... Um, kind of are encouraged to see the world and see the capitalist system as eternal, as inevitable. Um, and you can see that through certain morals. A classic one is stealing. That's obviously um, part of protecting private property. The idea it's wrong to steal. Yet, you know, extracting surplus labor, the huge theft that goes on every day, um, which allows the ruling class to maintain their wealth and their power, that's not seen as wrong or stealing. That's just seen as, as their kind of right to do that. Um, while if we were to suggest expropriating certain companies, um, certain people would say, oh no, that's wrong, that's stealing. So you can clearly see the class nature of morality, the, the role that it plays in maintaining the current system. Um, and in their morals and ours, Trotsky says on this point, from the point of view of eternal truths, revolution is of course anti-moral. But this merely means that the idealist morality is counter-revolutionary, that it is in the service of the exploiters. So then, but coming back on this point, some people might argue, they might say, okay, yeah, you know, some morals change, some things change in different societies, um, ownership, slavery, people used to think it's wrong. Uh, right now, people think it's wrong. But some things are always right or wrong, right? You know, killing is a classic one. People say, oh, every society um, doesn't, doesn't think it's right to kill. Every society, there's rules about killing. Um, and I mean, that's true to a certain extent. Um, most societies, if not all societies, have some kind of moral rules or moral judgments around killing. Um, and, you know, some people argue, oh, well, this just expresses, you know, some innate or some natural kind of moral norms that the whole of humanity has that I don't know we're born with or we just have deep inside. There's certain things that are right for humans and certain things that are wrong. Um, but I would completely disagree with this. You know, I would say, yeah, it's true. There are some moral norms that are in common across different societies. But that's because it's just the most basic things which allow us to live together in a group. Um, you know, it's understandable that there's going to be a lot of moral kind of codes that limit killing because a society where people just go around and kill each other all the time won't really last for very long. Um, but that doesn't mean there, it's natural or it doesn't mean it's innate. Um, it means that it comes from the needs of society and the needs of living in a group and the needs of preserving a society um, and I think it's what is important as well to note that quite often these kind of moral rules especially ones that are common in lots of different societies are often very variable and very contradictory so you know the idea it's wrong to kill um, something common in, in most societies yet you can kill if you're in the army and in fact it's seen as good to kill it's seen if there's a war it's a moral right to go and kill someone and um, so it's completely flipped um, and you know in self-defense it's seen as right to kill um, and even more ludicrously you know with the death penalty so we're told oh it's wrong to kill don't kill that's that's immoral and um, yet the state kills people um, in a lot of countries to kind of punish them for their wrongs. Um, so we can clearly see that even these kind of moral norms, which do supposedly exist across all different societies, are not enacted um, in a way that is consistent, is very contradictory, um, and obviously isn't kind of natural. I think kind of looking even deeper on the question of, well, what is a moral? What 
what is it to say something is right or something is wrong? Um, and I would say it's to say what you should or shouldn't do. You know, a moral is basically saying what is or what isn't permissible. And so this idea that morality, um, that we can make decisions on what we should or shouldn't do, that that could come from anywhere apart from the material world is completely ludicrous. Um, so the idea that we somehow have these inter you know, innate or eternal or natural moral truths, this is actually just a religious hangover um, from the past because you know, the idea that there could be right and wrongs which come from outside society, outside the material world, um, this could only come from a god, um, which is obviously something that we don't believe in. And this is like an illusion that we as Marxists should strip away. The only place that we can actually get rights and wrongs, decide on if an action is permissible or not, has to be from the material world. It can't come from kind of outside. Um, and on this point, Trotsky um, has a quote which I personally really like. And he says, whoever does not care to return to Moses, Christ, or Muhammad, whoever is not satisfied with eclectic hodgepodges must acknowledge that morality is a product of social development, that there is nothing invariable about it, that it serves social interests, that these interests are contradictory, that morality more than any other form of ideology has a class character. Um, so I think it's really important for us as Marxists to understand there is no innate or natural or everlasting right and wrongs. Right and wrongs, morality is a product of society, is a product of class society, and what we think in a given time is a result of the kind of class society that we're living under. So I guess then that moves on to where does that leave us then? as Marxists. Is there a Marxist morality? Um, you know, should we just throw it all away or, or how should we respond to it? And, you know, I think it's quite important that we don't believe in fixed moral codes. Um, we don't believe that there's just a list of things which are right and a list of things which are wrong. And we're quite clear in that cur current morality, the morality of the current society is bourgeois morality. It reflects the attitude of the bourgeois class and it serves to protect the interests of the ruling class. So we stand like in opposition to that. Um, but does that mean that we think that's it, there's no right or wrong, you should just go around and kill people randomly or lie freely or just do whatever, anything is permissible. Um, and we say, of course not, you know, morality is a question of what you should and shouldn't do. And just because we reject bourgeois morality, that doesn't mean you should just, we think you should do everything and anything. Um, so yeah, we don't have a list of things that you should and shouldn't do, like some religion, because we're a scientific philosophy. You know, before deciding if an action is permissible, we need to analyze the action. We need to think through the consequences. We need to weigh up what's gonna happen and then make a decision. Um, and there's obviously like a common uh, kind of moral code of the end justifies the means um, and you know should we as Marxists do we believe in all oh, the ends justify the means and I mean we do follow it to a certain extent because if you're not judging an action on its consequences what else are you judging it on you know if you're not judging or oh, should I do this this is what's going to happen you are just going back again to abstract moral codes to um, to religion or to idealism to basing your moral judgments on thin air but but the idea of the ends justifies the means, that alone is not enough. Because yes, the means should justify the ends, but the end aim also needs to be justified, you know? So if we look at the question, is it, is it justified to kill? Is it justified to kill for a nation? Well, you need to justify the nation, you know, is it justified to kill for God? You then need to justify your religion. Um, and I think this is like a really great thing that Trotsky kind of, um, goes into a bit more depth on in the pamphlet. Um, and he says, a means can be justified only by its end, but the end in its turn needs to be justified. From the Marxist point of view, which expresses the historical interests of the proletariat, the end is justified if it leads to increasing the power of man over nature and the abolition of power of man over man. So 
you know, we are Marxists and our actions um, are, and our, the consequences of our actions need to be justified by the fact um, that, that we are Marxists and we are fighting for the liberation of society. So that is what we need to judge everything by. Um, and, you know, philosophers kind of saying, oh, well, these are right or these are wrong. They never kind of go that further step. So maybe if they say, oh, it's right to kill for a nation, they never then say, well, why is it right to kill for a nation? What is the nation? Why do you think that is justified in itself? Um, because at the end of the day, bourgeois morality is about maintaining the status quo. And so that's only what could kind of be expected. So for us as Marxists, when we're deciding if something's moral, if we're deciding if something's right or wrong, if we're deciding if something's justified or not, we don't have a kind of outside moral code, but we weigh up the action with its consequences, with the aim of liberating society. Um, so Trotsky on this point says, permissible and obligatory are those and only those means we answer, which unite the revolutionary proletariat, fill their hearts with in irreconcilable hostility to oppression, teach them contempt for official morality and its democratic echoes, imbue them with consciousness of their own historic mission, raise their courage and spirit of self-sacrifice in the struggle. So we are fighting for revolution. Um, and in that, we have to weigh up actions and what effect that is gonna have in the class struggle. So we would see as wrong, or we would see as not permissible, actions which set parts of the working class against each other, because that is not gonna help us strive towards the aim of class struggle. So we see racism as wrong, um, because it sets part of the working class against each other and it weakens the working class. We see actions which lower people's consciousness as wrong, you know, things like religion. We would that as wrong because it lowers the working class's consciousness. We would see as wrong actions which make the class kind of docile or dependent or blindly following leaders. Um, we and again, it's not some kind of fixed moral code that we then write up on our walls and follow by every day. Um, but all actions must be weighed up in the moment, in the actual class struggle, as part of revolutionary strategy and tactics. And I guess like the, the other question is if we kind of hypothesize about a, a communist society, a future communist society, what would the morality of that society be? Again, would there just be no morals? Um, because morals is part of kind of ideology. And we'd say no, you know, people just wouldn't think everything is right or everything is wrong. Um, there would probably, there almost certainly would be a common understanding of right and wrong. There would be a kind of proletarian morality um, that, that I'm sure would say, well, senseless violence is wrong. Um, we've already said racism is wrong. Non-work, not participating in the running of society is wrong. But I think it would be slightly different in that people wouldn't just, you know, like in current society, people just maybe view morals as natural or eternal and just say, oh, that is bad because it's bad. But I think in a future, communist society would be a more developed understanding of morality and people would maybe say yeah senseless violence is wrong um, because that that destroys our fellow workers or not working is wrong because um, that's the basis that we you know we hold our society together and we're building a society together or racism is wrong because it divides the workers um, and it's a it's a kind of foreign idea that's been planted in our in our midst so it would be a more developed sense of morality that there isn't just a list of things that are right and a list of things that are wrong but we think through the consequences of the actions we think um, through what's going to happen and then kind of decide if something is permissible or not with recourse um, to the real material world and recourse to the actual consequences and aims in a kind of scientific manner. You know, as I've said, morality is part of ideology and it's part of the illusions and illusions in bourgeois mor morality are a key way in which the ruling class kind of maintains their power and that's something that we obviously need to work to strip away. We need to go out and, and say, you know, there are no eternal moral truths. There are no fixed set of things which are right and wrong, um, but we, as thinking, conscious human beings, have to make judgments all over where action, if actions are permissible or if they're not. And anyone kind of alive can see that that capitalism is horror without end, and the most moral, um, the most important thing that we can do is to strip away kind of illusions in bourgeois morality to kind of strip away the excuses and to kind of strip away, I guess, bourgeois ideology more, more um, broadly. Strip away the idea that the capitalist system is necessary, is useful, is inevitable. We need to work against that. 
Um, and I guess more broadly, we need to get to work building a revolutionary organisation which is capable of toppling this disgusting system and all of the vices that that brings with it, kind of once and for all. And I'd like to kind of end um, with a slightly longer quote um, which Trotsky used to end the pamphlet. Um, and I just think um, it's a really good kind of sum up of, of our view towards morality. Um, he said, in these immense events, the Trotskyists learned the rhythm of history, that is the dialectics of class struggle. They also learned, it seems, and to a certain degree successfully, how to so subordinate their subjective plans and programmes to the objective rhythm. They learned not to fall into despair over the fact that the laws of history do not depend on their individual tastes and are not so subordinated to their own moral criteria. They learned to subordinate their individual desires to the laws of history. They learn not to be frightened by the most powerful enemies if their power is in contradiction to the historical development. They know how to swim against the stream in the deep conviction that the new historic flood will carry them to the other shore. Not, will all, reach that, not all will reach that shore, many will drown, but to participate in this movement with open eyes and with an intense will, only this can give the highest moral satisfaction to a thinking being. Thanks.